Hi, this is Walter Weesey with Yellowstone Country Fly Fishing and Parks Fly Shop with my weekly fly time video from May 6th, 2020. And what I'm going to be doing here today is my favorite warm water bait fish pattern. Um, I'm going to be doing a fishing trip here in a couple weeks to eastern Montana to fish for bass and pike and crappies and bluegill and so forth. And uh, I'm filling my box and so I figured I'd show you something a little different than my usual trout flies. And this is a variation on the Murdich minnow, um, which is a famous Originally a striper pattern, but this is uh, this is you know a bass size version, and uh, I've kind of modified it a little bit here. I've got some synthetic material in the back there, which cuts down on a couple steps in the back, and I'm using a kind of a different body material for the front here. Uh, I've always tied this fly with some sort of a you know a body wrap material rather than the original Estaz, and uh, this gray and white version obviously sort of shad like, and that's my. That's my go-to smallmouth color. Um, I'm throwing a picture in the uh, of, a, of some smallmouth I catch on these things. Um, back mostly back in Missouri when I go back and visit family. But uh, gray and white, chartreuse and white, uh, fire tiger, which is this color version without the eyes. Um, you know, chartreuse and yellow, black and yellow, copper and pearl. You know, there's all kinds of different colors you can tie these in, uh, depending on what kind of bait fish you have. But uh, good basic pattern and not super difficult. Okay, now this is actually the second attempt at shooting this video. The uh, first time it didn't work. But anyway, I've got uh, a size 4 Montana Fly Company 7050, size 4, uh, in, the, in the vise here. And this is sort of a long shank, wide gap, fairly heavy uh, black nickel hook. And it's, a, it's a, actually a Kelly Gallup articulated streamer hook and I think it's a copy actually of uh, of a Daiichi that's very similar to this. Uh, I used to use Gamakatsu SPA 11 3L 3H which was a, a stainless version kind of a light salt water hook that was kind of the same shape but the big thing is it's instead of your standard Daiichi 810 which is what I used uh, or like TM TMCO 811 which is a little shorter than this, this is a pretty long shank hook. Now my tail and flash on this fly is going to be Farrar Flash Blend, and I believe this is just pearl white, possibly bucktail white. Um, and what I did there is, this, this normally comes in a, a huge hank this long, and uh, what I did there is just tied a, just took a, took a vise or a bobbin with um, flat wax nylon thread here and just made a loop around the middle there, and then super glued it. And that's how I kind of keep this, this stuff, you know, keep from, from uh, um, getting the stuff all knotted and stuff like that because in the package it's pretty unwieldy and I'm not tying any really big stuff with it you know if I was tying like, billfish flies or musky flies or something that, that wouldn't really work very well but uh, since I'm just tying mostly small pike and bass flies with it um, I, you know, I don't need that extreme length but anyway um, what I do there is I've got this material and it's kind of squared off at one end and then it kind of appears to have a natural taper, although, you know, each fiber isn't tapered at the other end here. And what I'm going to do there is I'm just going to grab that bunch of fibers kind of in the middle on the squared off side and then sort of taper that side as well. And uh, that's going to give me kind of a more natural appearance uh, when I... This is, hopefully is going to be enough of this. This is a little bit more ragged than I anticipated. But anyway, um, I'm going to take that and then just kind of loop that around the thread and make sure I get those those ends roughly even and then slide it all up to the body of the fly like this and I like to kind of do sort of a gathering wrap over the top half of the hook there and then and it, and it is a little slippery and so this will be a little bit uh, hard but anyway get that and just kind of bind that in with a few wraps right there and now that's not going to be secure yet um, I could, you know, really reef on that and make a big mound of thread to secure it, or I could just do the smart thing here, which is get some super glue. And I use a lot of super glue on this fly. Um, increases durability and uh, really helps anchor these synthetic materials in without a huge number of thread wraps. All right, so that part's done. And then my next kind of procedure here is I'm going to get some white ice fur. And this is how I make the... Uh, this is how I make the uh, uh, sort of gills or sort of the, the flank of the fly. So I'm going to get that and cut that off, and that's a little too that's a little too sparse for me, I think. And so I'm going to actually double that up. And this material, in contrast to the uh, 
to the Ferrar Flash Blend, I actually like to just tie it in. I don't, I don't uh, double it back on itself to secure it. So I'm going to take that in. I'm going to. You can either, if you want a cylindrical profile on your fly, you can tie it in like this, tie it on top of the hook, and then pull the other end down and tie it on the bottom of the hook. But what I actually like to do is, is get that kind of slab-sided shad sort of profile here. So what I like to do is come in on one side, usually the far side of the hook. And again, same deal, sort of a gathering wrap, and then spread it around uh, laterally around the, uh, the far side of the hook. And then what I'm actually going to do, this is sort of unusual, is uh, I'm actually going to trim that at a pretty ag aggressive angle there towards the eye. And I'm going to come around to the other side, my side, and do precisely the same thing on my side. And just kind of eyeball that and get it close. In terms of length. And then that, that bundle I'm actually going to wrap over as well, and maybe even a little further forward than the other bundle. And essentially the reason I'm tying this in like this um, is to create a little bit of a body taper to make it easier to wrap my body on this thing. I'm just kind of clean that up a little bit and wrap it back. And I'm not going to wrap it all the way up onto that, that uh, big bump I made when I tied in the... Uh, for our flash blend there. But that's kind of the, the back portion of the fly and you can kind of see why what happens when I tied that in uh, on either side of the fly like that. When this is wet, that's going to stream down and have kind of a nice natural taper into the back of the fly. So I'm going to pause this for a moment because there's no point in you watching me uh, dig around for materials. Okay, so my remaining two materials for this fly, and this is a little bit of a change from how I originally tied it and this is really where the variation from the Merdage Minnow comes in. I've got a piece of the uh, faux fur yarn that I've used on a few of my recent videos and a piece of UV pearl uh, polar chenille. And what I used to use for this fly is no longer made and that's why I'm kind of experimenting with new stuff. This is a Montana Fly Company Lucent chenille which you know it kind of has that same uh, it's, it's only coming off of one side of the uh, the core there and it's a synthetic material but it's fairly fine it's got a lot of flash and so I'm trying to replicate that the original Murditch minnow actually uh, used I believe it was uh, like Estaz or Cactus Chenille and I've never actually tied the standard version of it I've always tied it with something that's sort of a body wrap material that I can then trim uh, to more of a bait fish profile so I'm going to tie that both those materials in um, sequentially here. Now I'm not going to like rib it with the uh, that polar chenille or anything like that. What I'm actually going to do is twist it into a rope, um, kind of complex twist style. And the reason I'm going to do that rather than going kind of bunny leech style um, is that I find when if I just wrap the materials in sequence, you know, I, I would I've done this and it, it looks good as a bunny leech actually, but if I just wrap things like this, and that that obviously isn't how I would do it, but if I just wrap them up the hook shank, um, you know, taking more care than I did there, um, it winds up being a little thin. It doesn't, uh, you know, it, it, the, the material compresses too much, and so it it flows really well, but it doesn't retain any bulk when you strip it. And so what I'm going to wind up doing is I, you know, secured my thread up at the front there and uh, dropped my bobbin cradle, and I'm actually going to super glue all this again just to be sure. And while that's drying, I'm going to grab my uh, gator clip hackle pliers here. And uh, this is really helpful if you're going to be doing any kind of complex twist sort of stuff here. Because this is a really, really heavy uh, base here. And that, that makes a big difference in terms of uh, how easy it is to twist things. But I'm going to grab those two materials. And I'm not really too worried about which way they're oriented or anything like that. Because I'm going to twist them up anyway. But I'm going to pull those tight and try to get them kind of even tension. That way it, it doesn't wind up being, you know, one side of it doesn't wind up being looser than the other. And kind of brush out the material some here just to keep it from binding up when I twist. But then I'm just going to go ahead and give her a twist. And I'm going to twist that up pretty aggressively actually. I want that uh, that really strongly roped. And you can kind of see what's happening there as I twist it. Is it's it's a the apparent length of it is shortening. And so that, that's tightening up the material and making it more of a chenille. And uh, that helps it retain bulk 
in comparison to just wrapping it up the hook shank. Uh, it's a little harder, it takes a little longer, but it winds up looking better. Anyway, I'm going to go in here now with my toothbrush, and I will brush this again at least once, um, but I'm going to come in and just kind of brush that out as much as I can, free as many of those trapped fibers as I can. And then, once that's done, kind of br try to brush it as much as I can to one side of the of the uh, kind of brush here. I'll, I'll have to keep brushing it back as I go, but kind of brush that in, in to one side and then just start start wrapping. And I am going to try to make those uh, touching turns of that material. I want it pretty thick. And it's going to look terrible while I'm wrapping it up the hook here. Uh, that's a okay. You know, I'm going to going to brush this again, like I said, and then I'm actually going to give it a haircut too. Now, if I was going bunny leech style, uh, obviously, then I wouldn't give it a haircut. And a rotary vise, obviously, is very helpful for this purpose. All right, so I'm there at the front. And it can be fairly easy to crowd the eye on this. I may have done that again. Did it on the sample fly. I'm going to come in here, and I like to just get a couple wraps and then get rid of that. Um, that the rest of that brush so I don't bind down any more of those fibers because obviously the, the longer that brush sits there at the front of the fly the more the fibers that I'm cutting off anyway I'll trap and I'll wind up getting a bulkier head than I want but after I get that in there I'll clean that up a little bit I did, I did do a better job on that one and then I'm going to whip finish now the tying part of this fly with the exception of brushing it out uh, is over but I'm going to get arts and craftsy here in a second I'm going to brush it out again, and the uh, the flash obviously is much much longer than the the uh, the brush, the the uh, faux rabbit, but uh, and I wind up giving that a haircut here in a moment. So I'm going to get that kind of brushed out, and I'm going to try to move those fibers uh, essentially towards the middle of the hook there, and so they're sticking out perpendicular to the hook, and. I'm going to go in one more time here with a bodkin, again just kind of hoping to pull out the majority of those fibers that I may have bound down. And if I really bound it down bad, I'd actually use a gun brush, um, but uh, as long as you're pretty careful about you know, brushing the material back after every turn, you usually don't need to be brushing it that aggressively. But anyway, get that about like that, and then time for a haircut. So what I like to do first here is come in and do the sides of the fly, and I want those pretty flat and tapered because I'm looking for a sort of a slab-sided vertical sort of profile on this fly. So I'm going to come in here and make a sort of this angle uh, cut from front to back, so it's tapered from front to front to back, like that. And I'm going to do the same thing about the same angle on the other side. And I like to do the bottom next, and so I'm going to come in from the bottom, and I, you know, I, you can kind of see here the hook point's basically hidden. And granted, this is a fairly soft material, and so you're not going to, you're not going to, you know, reduce the gape that much. But anyway, I, I still like to have as much hook exposed as I can, and so I'm going to make this a pretty flat cut front to back. You know, it doesn't have quite that aggressive of a taper. And on the top here, I don't want much of a taper at all. I want the top to be a lot of a big place for uh, to get that vertical sort of profile. And so I like to come in and just do a very steep cut at the front, and then a much flatter cut at the back, and then that's it at the top. Um, the next step here is I'm going to go in from the sides and kind of trim off where I didn't trim already, and sort of taper it, taper things in together. Uh. And obviously these are going to be much less aggressive cuts on the, these little corner cuts here. And then my final trim, I actually like to take that out of the vise. And then kind of, you know, trim it up. You, you know, obviously take off less than you think you need to, because you can always trim away more. And in contrast to a stiffer material, this will all kind of blend together uh, pretty nicely anyway. That's about right. All right. So, what I've got right now is essentially a white bait fish, and I want a gray and white bait fish, and so of course I need to use, uh, you can kind of see here, looking at my fingers, you can kind of see the different uh, colors on my fingers there. Um, I've been tying the 
fire tiger version for the most part this morning and I'm just out of the eyes that I wanted to use on that that's why I switched over to gray and white for the video but uh, I'm brushing away all those those loose fibers again here just to get I'm not really brushing it out I'm just trying to get rid of the, the fluff that got trapped after I cut it but I'm gonna break out a gray and white uh, marker or I'm sorry a gray marker and what I'm using here is a cool gray 60% Prismacolor marker but really a sharpie anything would be fine and I'm going to kind of get pretty aggressive with that. I uh, like to get it down almost to the midpoint of the body and all the way down to the base of all those fibers. And so you really have to kind of kind of color in there, scribble a little bit. And most of the color is going to be in the uh, in the uh, forward portion of the fly. And hopefully it's showing up here. I don't know if it's going to show up in the video, but those uh, flash fibers in there. Uh, in the polar chenille I actually get a lot of color when I color on them. You can really see the UV a lot more once they've gotten grayed up some. But um, anyway, I did the front portion of that and I'm actually going to go back into the ice fur and uh, into the, the, the tail material as well. Now if you wanted a more color in the tail, you could use two colors in the tail. Uh, in fact, I used to tie this fly with a uh, um, Icelandic sheep for the the top portion of the tail and that would really be a, a dark gray you know because that was the it was dyed to that color and that would be a, a really really aggressive dark gray and honestly it's just one more step I don't need that that much color in the tail I don't think but if you want it you could use two colors of the uh, flash blend if you like or you could use like I said Icelandic sheep or some other you know gray material to give a darker back if you think the fly needs it but I kind of like actually having that sort of gradation of color. Um, you know, it's the the uh, forward portion of the fly here is very dark gray, you know, kind of very prominent slaty sort of gray. And then the, the ice fur winds up more of a shimmery gray. And, you know, I could use, I could use gray ice fur too, but uh, I kind of like that kind of solid gray, shimmery gray, and then very pale gray that it winds up being for the tail there. All right, so there is the... Um, the tying portion complete and the coloring portion complete and now I got to put eyes on it and the eyes I'm using here are quarter inch uh, Mirage lure eyes and I also like the color called super pearl and so what I'm gonna do there is I almost forgot to do it these are stick-on eyes but of course this you know they, they'd come off immediately if you didn't add some adhesive but I like to put in a little dab of gel super glue and more than I expect to need actually and then just kind of set that eye on there and then use a bodkin or in this case I'm going to use my uh, um, the tip of my my uh, whip finisher to kind of mash the eye into the glue some and if you use your finger to mash into the glue odds are you're going to glue on your fingers and then you know have a disaster trying to get the uh, get your finger off the fly you rip the eye off you get glue on the eye you know it just it doesn't look good and I'm going to do the same thing on the other side here good size drop of gel type super glue and I, I get the Loctite uh, ultra gel control which has a, a little bit of a longer working time than some of the other super glue gels anyway I kind of gently push that onto the fly but then when I want to really push down on it number one I want to make sure that I'm not too far forward which I kind of am anyway uh, when I really want to push on it I'm going to use a bodkin or scissors or something like that to to really get that that eye onto the fly you could leave it at that. Uh, I also like to add some more adhesives. And so I'm going to get some UV Cure Resin. This is Loon UV Thin. And I'm just going to kind of go around those eyes. So sort of going a little bit over the top of the eye, um, but kind of right around the edge of the eye, just kind of a thin layer around each eye. And then I'm also going to do a little bit, this, you know, I didn't apply any cement to the, uh, the head there. And so that's also what I'm going to use for head cement um, in place of super glue. All right, and I'm going to get my death ray. And I don't tie a lot with uh, UV resins. I mean, if you're looking for really good resin work, I'm not your guy for that. Um, but, uh, you know, I do, I do think they help a lot in reinforcement like this.
I did just also order a much bigger uh, torch. I ordered a Loon Infinity Torch, which is actually a rechargeable USB-powered uh, light, and uh, that'll speed up this process considerably. Okay, that's about, about good. And one of the things that makes a lot of sense if you do have kind of weak light like I do is just take the thing outside after you've got it more or less set. And, the, you know, the, obviously the sun's the most powerful UV torch there is. And then the last step here, because the Loon UV Cure, uh, the thin is actually not, uh, it, it, it's actually a little bit tacky. I'm coming in here and I'm going to give that a little bit of Sally Hansen's as well. And you could also use Loon uh, UV Flow, which is not tacky, if you wanted to get this additional coating here. And all these adhesives do add a little bit of uh, durability as well. This gray and white is my kind of small mouth color, but you know, uh, if a pike eats it, a little bit more durability here at the front, uh, as long as he doesn't chop off the tippet, uh, is going to help keep that thing from unraveling. But anyway, there you go. There's a gray and white Murdich minnow variation. Uh, I'll be using that here in a couple weeks out in eastern Montana. Uh, mostly the fire, fire tiger version, because um, I do fish for pike a lot. Uh, you know, I even got wire leaders for it. But uh, that gray and white in clear water is a really good smallmouth color, and obviously largemouth, um, probably white bass hybrids, etc. too. As always, thanks for watching, and I will see you next week. P.S. Uh, forgot one step here, which is to add a little bit of red. And sometimes I'll do this actually using uh, sheep fleece. Uh, I'll just, you know, tie in some sheep fleece while I'm here at the back of the fly, but I think it does exactly the same job to just use a red magic marker uh, to add a little bit of red to the back end of the body there to be gills and or, um, and or blood. You know, a little red on a baitfish never hurt anybody. So, P.S. ended, and again, I'll see you next week.